first of all, Forrest, thank you for um, for doing this. I know everybody in SPG is going to be super excited to hear from you, and I appreciate it. Adam, too. Thank you. Thank and, you uh, for getting me started on the path that ended up either ruining or saving my life. I don't know. <laughs> That's how you look at it. Yeah. As we are just saying a minute ago, the last time I saw you, I think, was at the Conor McGregor Mayweather after party, in which case all we could do is really yell hi at each other as loud yep. as we could. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really had a chance to sit down and talk with you since. So I, I collected a bunch of questions from people, some questions for you, some questions for Adam that we can go through. But before I, I start jumping on that, why don't you tell everybody what you've been doing? Because I don't think everybody knows what you did and what you what your job has been at the UFC since. Yeah, okay. So I started with the UFC actually in 2013. Um, kind of a little bit of a famous story. I just started showing up and going to meetings and doing stuff. And eventually they were like, if you show up at enough meetings, you get assigned like responsibilities. And then if you like keep showing up, it gets to a point where people notice if you don't show up. So you just have to keep working. And you know, for a while I was thinking, what the hell have I gotten myself into? I should have just kind of like waited for them to call me. But then, you know, they'd call every once and again, hey, can you go uh, hand this big check to some kids? And I'd be like, yeah, I feel like a douchebag showing up once a month to hand like, hey, here's me with this organization I never met. So, you know, let me let me actually get involved with these organizations. And, you know, I was on the boards of a couple of charities and I kind of helped, I guess you call it community out. I forget, corporate social responsibility is what it's called now. It used to be community outreach. And then I, I got wind that there was, um, you know, kind of a department starting that was going to uh, basically design training and performance, you know, starting the Performance Institute. And so for over a year, we basically went around to some of the best teams and, and clubs in the world. And, you know, we got to look under the dress or behind the curtain. And, uh, you know, because we are a fighting sport, then baseball, hockey, basketball, um, you know, football proper, they all, you know, they were all like, hey, here's what we do. Here's how we, you know, interact with our athletes. Here's some of the stuff. And I think, you know, it, it starts from from what Adam got me started on. And then, you know, I later kind of stole from Randy is, you know, how do you integrate all these things, right? So that was my concept when I started is just the integration of services, what we say now, you know, you know, I got, I got, I got a PT because I got shoulder problems. I got a good strength coach, shout out Andrew. I got a real good Muay Thai coach. I got a good Jits coach. I got a good wrestling coach. Who the hell, you know, how, it doesn't work. You know, my load, my training, like, you know, I've identified I need to work on this skill for this fight, but how much can I, how much do I still have to train this skill so it doesn't get worse to, you know, devote to my counter wrestling and my wrestling get ups, right? How much do I still have to train stand up so I don't lose what I have, right? So what's that percentage? How many times a week should I go hard? How does my body react to the training? You know, what's my internal load here? Am I, you know, am I redlining every day? And I think what, what I did was because I had a very, you know, a poor mentality in the sport. I, I just always kind of thought harder was better. And when you, when you train and you think harder is better, you're not actually up here. You're here because you're trying to do it every day. Turns out you can't train that way every day. So you train in this kind of muddy middle, I call it, right? Instead of your truly low days and your truly high days, you're just always in the middle and you're not creating a physiological adaptation. You're not, you know, you're not letting yourself learn the skill. So one of the things kind of, you know, I've identified in the last three years is there should be skill work, there should be drill work, which, I mean, Adam, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not a driller. We would start practice, we'd do two moves and I'd be like, all right, let's fight now. Let's do it. Um, so, you know, just how do we get all those things together? How do we incorporate sports science and then sports psychology? Um, you know, so it's been an education and we've been doing this now for three years. And I think the Performance Institute, like there's 640 fighters on the roster now. In our existence, we've seen over 500 fighters. It's cool though. You can actually potentially see more fighters than are on the roster because you see people that get cut or people that retire and then et cetera. So. So how close in, in that time frame? So you started, you have all these really good questions because it's a new sport. And how close do you think you guys have come to answering those questions somewhat definitively since then? So, yeah, no, I think honestly, we've answered a lot of those questions. Now, the, what we're, how do we, 
adapt this information to a fighter, a fight camp, a gym? How do we individualize kind of what we know to be the general guidelines of, you know, preparation for the sport of MMA? How do we, how do we message that in the sense that people can actually take that program on, right? Um, and what we've been doing now is just like literally one person at a time, you know, and, and it's not the most efficient way. But what I will say is we get one or two people from a gym in. They see what a training session can feel like. They see what how, how it can integrate, how your your 45 minutes of intense lift on your sparring day actually, you know, helps you on that sparring day. Right. You know, it potentiates you for better sparring. And you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't think that would work for me, but it, it will work. So then they, hopefully they take that to their home gym and they say, look, I know there's a better way. If we structure out a plan, um, you know, so it started from that physiological sense. And I think there's a big understanding of that. And now kind of what I'm trying to move into from the physiological response of understanding the body is to how do we acquire the skill of MMA, right? So MMA is potentially seven different martial arts and it's ever evolving, how do we train these skills in a manner that, you know, on fight day in the octagon, there's that transfer of training. So all the shit we did on the fence here, that it actually comes out. A lot of people don't know this, but I wrestled a ton in my camps. And you can tell that by the way, I never wrestled <laughs> ever in fights. And I don't, you know, it, it was just a lack of integration, right? Yeah, that brings me actually one of the questions, which was from Robert Verdell, who's a, a good wrestling coach, had a question about your body lock outside trip, which you did have a good percentage of getting in the fights. And his question was how you train that safely. So compared to how you trained when you were fighting and how you train athletes now, how do you how do you get them working in wrestling safely so they're not getting injured? So a, a lot of it's about knowing your training partners. And, and you know, I call it almost – helpful resistance right like so adam's gonna body lock me and take me down i know that i'm gonna feed him my hips a little bit i'm not gonna make it ridiculous but you know i defend the takedown enough just to protect myself and then i might even what, what i'm notoriously bad about doing is as you take me down i'll kind of turn a little different than you think a guy would instead of fighting it to protect myself and the other thing here is i like i like to go you know everybody drilling shouldn't be a problem so I like to drill a couple minutes and then live a couple minutes and then drill a couple minutes and then live a couple minutes where we're, we're going cooperatively. And then we're, we're, you know, the other thing like I would get, and when we started Adam, we would do like 20 minutes of learning, 30 minutes of rolling. Right. So it was more broken up where I think now what we try to do is never be, never stop moving for more than a couple minutes. So you don't cool down and then go again. You remember the old, like when we go to the Brazilian practice, it was like learn three moves and roll, you know? We never did that. I, no, I call, like, yeah, what you're talking about now, I actually, I call uh, dead alive. So I, I will take the new skill or the dangerous skill and I'll make that part of the drill dead so that the person knows how to fall properly. The person doesn't do anything stupid or invent something stupid, which is what athletes love to do. And then when it hits the area where they're comfortable or safe, then it goes live. So if you're working that takedown with me, I'm giving you some energy, some balance, but I'm not doing anything stupid. As soon yeah. as we hit the ground, now we're safe. And now this is where I really have to get up. Then I'll give it that real go. Yeah. And that's where you see it a lot. Like I'm going to punch Set up the takedown, I'm going to punch into it. The second your hip or back hits, boom, you're scrambling up and we're going live. Or what, what I like to do even more than that is the 70-30 uh, drill. So I'm going to go 70% live, touch, 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 put you on the ground. As soon as we hit the ground, now you're going 70% live and I'm going 30%. And now I'm your drilling as you get up or vice versa, however you want to start. Right. Drill, right? I feel, yeah. The, you had a, fair a lot of it. That and I've forgotten it. Well, it just depends on what, what, what skills you want to bring out and whose skills you're trying to work on at that point. Because if not, it just degenerates into sparring. Well, the other thing I get a lot of people doing is where you will go all out. Like you do your three rounds of actual sparring. Then you will continue to do some skill work, high intensity, exploding, like on the mitts. And then you'll turn for 15, 10, 15 seconds, right? and just defend a punch from a live person punching at you. 
Now you may know what they're going to throw. You may not, you know, again, the constraints, how many variables you want to add, well, it's going to depend on their, their training age, et cetera. But right. So a lot of times, you, you know, so I want you to punch that max explosion and then I want you to defend and Hey, you can only defend with the jab and the teeth kick. Do that for 20 to 30 seconds back on the mats. It's the same thing we always did positionally, like with the, the get ups to the, you know, I guess, I call it Shark Tank. A lot of people call a lot of things Shark Tank, but yeah. where you would basically be on half side. You'd be going live. I'd get up. I'd have to get to the mitts. I'd, I'd go half guard bottom again. I'd have to escape, get up to, you know. Those are yeah, for your but, high intensity days, though. Yeah, well, but also one of the easiest ways you can get someone to realize that they're not in MMA shape is to make them get up and down. Yeah. You know, the do a round, take anyone and do five minutes of hard grappling, then get up and do boxing and then vice versa, and they realize that everything is now changed. And if we can do that with on the cage and in box, and then on the ground and on the cage, and then if we can mix up, we can really screw up, for lack of a better term, their energy systems and really get them to figure out where they may have issues. Mm -hmm. This brings up another question that multiple people asked in different ways for both of you. Which was oh, Matt? I'm sorry. The answer was wrestlers are knuckleheads. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of young fighters are still training too hard. A lot of fight camps, a lot of schools are still training too hard, technically or, or apparently, because people are asking me this question quite a bit. And so, what would you say to another camp or coach or a young athlete who's what? Is, what are their signs that they're overtraining? Oh, well, I mean, oh, physiological overtraining signs, you know, like I wear the little O ring, you know, uh, either your heart rate variability decreases, your, your sleep patterns decrease, your uh, heart rate during sleep increases. And then you would look for, you know, you would look for percentage change over time, right? Um, and I'm, you know, there's, 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 uh, aerobic and anaerobic overtraining. So I, I would look at it a little difference though. Okay. There's times I think in MMA where you need to be intense. I think what the mistake I know I made and I see other people making is the, the uh, kind of the, the, if you wanna like on sparring day, 15 minutes of high intensity. It's just the volume of high intensity work, right? So you can have a high volume of work. In fact, you should have a good high volume of work, right? Um, and then you just have to control that intensity. The other thing I see like specific to this question is, and this is something that I was very poor about doing. And because fighters think in a camp camp mindset, they don't always do is that accumulation phases, right? So just, you know, you think about like, you'd call it fundamental periodization. You should take a couple weeks where you're actually increasing the load three weeks or two weeks, you know, decrease, increase, increase, decrease. Right, so where you're you're manipulating your volume so you can get a very high, you know, chronic to acute, you know, workload, etc. Right, so basically you're trying to work a lot, but when you're working intense, you want to be working intense, and when you're not, you want to know you're not. So I hear guys tell me they're doing eight rounds of sparring. I'm like, okay, is there like what are you doing? Like, is this touch sparring where you're like, you know, and I've seen Connor do it where he'll do eight or ten rounds, but you're touch sparring, you're you're thinking through. It's not like there's very little risk or intent. Like I'm not intending to take your head off and there's very little risk. Like I might try a technique, but, but you know, that's touch sparring, right? And that's fine too. But when we're doing like, you know, pre-fight fight fight camp sparring, yeah, then, then, you know, the intensity is going to be high. Just keep the volume low. And, you know, I think Adam can attest to this as well. When do you see guys getting hurt? That fifth round, that sixth round, your nervous system shot, you're physiologically shot, you can barely, you know, you can barely protect yourself to an extent. Or even if I'm shooting in, I'm gonna be shooting a little sloppier than I would and fall on you, right? I think I think what Forrest he said it earlier and he's alluding to it again, is we see people put in this tremendous amount of work in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because there's only so much high intensity work you can put in of any quality. So when you really look at it, what you're seeing is a tremendous amount of volume in the middle. And that's where guys start to get in trouble. And so what Forrest has really been pushing is this idea of high and low. And knowing when to go high 
and when to go low and not being in the middle six, seven days a week. Right. But I think people are also asking the question about contact, mm -hmm. which is, so Forrest is answering the question about intensity and training, mm -hmm. which is very important. Overall, and yeah. overall, and, and is one of the mechanisms for injury. And then the other thing pe that people are asking about is how much contact, right. how That's much, is yeah. That is that specific to, you know, striking like head impacts? Like, so the impact load is what we would call it. I would, I would think that people are not asking a question about hard grappling. They are really asking a question about hard hitting of the head. Boxing, yeah. So, you know, we're actually working with the Cleveland Clinic here to kind of identify some parameters around that. Um, I've done a ton of research on this because I wrote, I wrote an article about basically sparring. And unfortunately, there's not a ton uh, of information out there. What there is is on football. Um, there's, no, there's no definitive study or research. And if you can find one, please, that says you should wait 72 hours between sparring. But I put that in there because I just feel like from an inflammation standpoint, if we spar hard on Tuesday, we don't necessarily need to spar hard hard on on thursday like which we used to do let's spar hard on tuesday and friday or wednesday and saturday or you know let's let's maximize our rest in between um you know if you do get dinged and hurt you're out of practice you have to do a practice kind of like what i what i was saying where you're hitting the pads at 100 percent, but then defending and kind of a speed and back and forth and that may count as your sparring um if you've been dinged up but but yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, that's overall impact load. And, and that's the one thing I would say is, are you doing eight rounds kind of hard? Why don't you just do the three rounds or five rounds if it's a title fight hard and then stop? The other thing is when we're accumulating that sparring volume and we're out of shape, this is when I got hurt a couple times. I, was, I wasn't in shape. I was sparring with people that had their fight coming up. Take a round off in between. Like, I'll do three total rounds, but I'm not in the shape you're in and I'm almost to return to training protocol, I'll go one round high intensity, one round shadow boxing, and then my second or final round high intensity, right? And then I'll build up to where I can do them in a row. I think that there is a discussion that needs to be had, and I think Forrest is having this with camps about how much contact there is. And in Forrest's case, he's dealing with guys who are at the world-class level. Right. And I think that that is different than the contact that newer athletes, if you had a room full of really new, young, hungry guys, mm -hmm. are going to need or require or want. Like or an NFL practice that. is going to be different in some respects than a college practice. Right. Because a 30-year-old professional athlete doesn't need to know how to get hit anymore. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be I meant to, to add earlier on the volume of training, right? We, we trained a lot when we were 23. You know, it's, it's just a different body when you're 33 and 23 or 30. You know, the average UFC athlete is like 30, 30 years, two months, right? So that's a different, you know, that's a different beast than when you're 23, 24, right? It's just a different, you know, you're, you're just a different body, a different physiological adaptation to that training. Do you see them getting, you think they're going to get younger as the sport progresses? I mean, I, I think to an extent, right? Because I, I would say like personally, I saw a Ronda Rousey syndrome where I looked at my gym and I saw all these teenagers or preteen kids training. And like, as those kids train, uh, I forget his name. He was actually at a Ronda Rousey's camp. He just got beat up pretty good. But he was one of those kids that started training when he was, you know, started doing mixed martial arts when he was 13. And then I think as the amateur system evolves, you will get younger fighters, right? Because they, they now have that mad experience, much like a collegiate wrestler that's already wrestled all the way through high school. So you might have 20 or 30, you know, mixed martial arts fights by the time you're 18, 19. So whereas I didn't even start acquiring that skill set till I was 20. And we were very fortunate because the sport was so young, you could be older in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely athletes will get younger, but it still takes a while to acquire all these skills.
Mm -hmm. I think you'll see athletes get younger, but I also think you'll see athletes with more experience. Something that you see in something you see in the boxing ranks. If I watch a boxing match with two young guys that I don't know, if one of them has 200 amateur fights, that's who I'm going to bet on. Sure. And, and I, in the early days, even now, you'll see guys go pro after five, six, ten fights. I'm hoping at some point, like Forrest said, you'll have guys with 30 amateur fights. Yeah. Well, that is very much an American thing. Um, you know, IMAF, the internet, it's very popular. Like, in Europe, there's a lot more amateur fights than in mm-hmm. the States. You know, it, you know why, why would you fight amateur in the States? You know? Uh, yeah, so you know you're you're fighting to get better, to get experience, and that that's kind of what what happens in Europe, you know, developmental. Uh, but but yeah, so. And and as and when you think about that age difference in in practice, the thirty year old UFC fighter in the room is probably not getting hit because he is that much better than the majority of the youngsters. So there's this. There's this process where the younger fighters are the ones taking that punishment until they learn to develop those skills or get weeded out. Mm -hmm. Once they develop those skills, they're no longer getting hit hard, hopefully. It's the younger fighters that are now taking it. It's almost the idea of what's the value of a high-level striker sparring a low-level striker. Right. And the value is the high-level striker can work his timing and movement without really worrying about being hit. Mm -hmm. But the young fighter is going to give some years of his, you know, brain to that process. And I don't think that that can be short-circuited. And if I'm wrong, let me know. Hmm. No, that's actually something I meant to point out at, at Matt's earlier question, you know, the, you know, and, and that's been the boxing model forever, right? You bring the guy in and then the three or four guys surround the guy and they're, none of them are at his level. Whereas what, what we see in, in MMA is we get more people the same level in these super camps sparring more. Although I, I think, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows. Like right now you're getting people saying, okay, I'm going to break off and do what's best for me. Another one I get, I got to ask quite a bit, which kind of ventures a little bit away from professional fighting, but aging as an athlete i got a lot of questions like that for adam but for you as well and TRT. TRT all the way all the TRT. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people want to know if you still train like do you train and do you enjoy training uh i work out almost every day yeah. it's, i was doing a little teaching a little gi jiu-jitsu before covid but um I actually have to get both my shoulders replaced at some point. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't roll live. I move around with, well, I haven't recently since COVID really, but I used to move around with a a mitt holder, you know? Um, Yeah. Last time I I sparred maybe two years ago and a 55 or through spinning heel kick and I'm flinchy because I don't spar a lot and I flinched right into it. And I was like, and I just told him, hey, no spinny stuff. But, uh, you know, he was like, he, he was fired up to be working with me, right? And I was like, I don't need to take those. I don't, I don't need, this is, this is not good for me. It's but, funny you say that. I just, I just boxed with an amateur fighter the other day for the first time in over a year probably. That I had not boxed in a while because my neck is shot and I don't want to get hit. But he had no partners and... I spar with him and I'm like, this is stupid. Like, what's the, but man, is it fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the question know. about older Getting athletes older. has two answers though. One of those is an answer for far, that far should answer. And that is older professional athletes. Yes. Making the transition out of the sport. Well, different. Oh. So how does an athlete age within the sport? Mm-hmm. And I think Far Far should answer that. And then the question is, how does a how does an active adult age in this hobby we do? Right. Like, how do we stay on the jujitsu mat? How do we keep sparring if we want to do that? Those are I'd like Forrest to answer about because thirty years old to me is old. Like, if you're in the NFL, thirty years old, you're starting to wrap up your career. 
But if that's the average age of, an, of a UFC fighter, how are we keeping them at a world-class level? Yeah, it's it's because of the, the years of skill acquisition it takes, right? So I, I would equate being a mixed martyrs being a fighter to being um, like one day you're going to be the quarterback and then on the next play you're going to be the tackle and on the next play you're going to be the kicker, right? There's so many skills you have to learn. So it'd be like, hey, how do you learn all those skills? You know, so that, that that's, I think, the difference, right? And even baseball, like guys are so, you know, focused on specific and they do like a thing that, that you know, that's why those sports are silly. In fighting, you, you have to be able to do it all and then adapt your opponent doing it as well. So to, uh, you know, aging in the sport, guys get – smarter training habits, they eat better, uh, recovery, they, they make recovery a priority, they still do their learning sessions. And then something that, that I would did at the very end, pretty well in my career was, I didn't work with newbies, I worked, I had my three or four guys, and I would come in and test the guy out. And I would watch a guy spar and be like, yeah, yeah, you want to, sp- we'll, we'll spar, we'll spar, you and me, we'll, you know, um, and ironically, I was paying the guy that blew my knee out and ended my career to work. <laughs> I had paid him to come in and work. <laughs> but I mean, I needed, he was a high level division one wrestler. That's what I needed. I was, you know, so. Um, Didn't you repay that favor to another division one oh, wrestler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did. I did. Uh, this is like the worst thing ever. And I believe it or not, Adam, I actually had a reputation out here as being a good training partner. And I tried to show Clint, our, our, our dietitian here, lead dietitian here, um, just you know, basic like take dance. And I forgot like to grab the lad and to post some arm. I forgot like everything. And I just fell into his knee and just it. And that's, that was the other time I was like, yeah, we're done, we're done grappling. And I, I just tried to do a thing that was really easy for me. It was really easy five years before. Now, a buddy of mine, uh, a couple guys retired in the NFL. They said the key is just never stop moving. And that's one thing I do. Like I've, I mean, I'm, I'm lighter than I was in high school right now. Uh, not, not on purpose. I would like to be heavier, but, you know, it is what it is. I, I think you'd male hormone or something. I, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so I never stop moving. So at least, you know, if I move, get a shake out, I feel okay. Sure. But as far as so how then, you stay on... Sorry. No, no, I was Go just going to turn over to you. Well, so now I the, the answer does not change at all, which is why I wanted you to go first. But you really, I think you hit on the two most important things that I have found because I'm 48 years old and I want to stay on the mat. I want to do jujitsu two or three days a week. I want to move around and shadow box and do that. Two things that have made a a difference is I don't ever stop. I remember, remember we went to a camp once and Randy was talking about training seven days a week. And he's like, Sunday might be a hike with the dogs for 10 miles. I'm like, that's a workout for me. But for him, that was rest. Mm -hmm. And if I never stop, that's a big thing for me. And the other is recovery becomes just as important as everything else. You know, what, what is your recovery plan? Um, I can't believe how many books and things I, cur- I read and have on my shelf just about how to stretch my hip or how to, you know, do these weird shoulder exercises just to stay on the mat. Yeah. And then the last thing Forrest said about training partners, I, you've talked about your, also, Matt. It's like, I would love to go in the gym tonight throw my belt in the middle and be like, let's go motherfuckers. But I can't do that anymore. Like I, I can go super hard with a black belt because I know he's not going to do anything stupid. Right. But I can, I got to be real careful even going medium with a blue belt. Yeah. A big one. Yeah. Don't, don't roll with the Forrest Griffins of the world. Don't do it. <laughs> no. That will hurt you. <laughs> you know, up, uh, Steve Bazia, I don't know if you remember Steve, but he's one of the guys from South Africa when we went a long time ago, which I think now that I think back was 20 years ago. But he asked if you would talk about the story there. And I can say briefly, that's where I don't know if it was the first time, but within the first couple seconds of your fight there, your shoulder was dislocated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lifted you in the air is actually probably the 
the highest takedown I've ever seen in my life. Lifted you up in the air and dropped you, and your arms. But you went on to win the fight. And I and I if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know you were the one telling telling Rory and I that you didn't want to want to throw in the towel. You wanted to finish the fight. Well, you know the best part of that story um, is is that we uh, we actually got paid in like a little safari that was after the trip. Yeah. And my shoulder was pretty much out, in and out, the whole, like, three days. We were, like, going down water slides, and I'm, like, I didn't even drink liquor. I'm, like, trying to, ch to choke down liquor to kill the pain. Um, like, you, you can get cocaine in South Africa, no problem. But you want pain pills? No. No, sir. And I, I was, like, I would eat anything, like a leave, Advil. No, none of that. Uh, so literally I was like trying to drink liquor in the morning. Just my shoulder hurt so bad. He fought another fight in another foreign country where yeah. he broke another bone and kept fighting and won again. Well, you know, which never, look never at reach it. down for the leg kick. Never reach down to catch the leg kick. That's, <laughs> that's like karate 101. I reached down to catch the leg kick. I mistimed it. It broke my little, uh, uh, ulna. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and you won that one also. Yeah, my shoulder was out of the socket when I finished that guy too. I ended up getting him with a rear naked choke. Here's the thing about that. Oh, what, what's that? He got on his back and finished him. Yeah, it, it, if it had gone to the round, I would have quit. Okay, <laughs> I was going to fight the whole round. Down. But, but if we went to like the quarter, I'd be like, nah, I'm not going back out. So I think I got paid 300 bucks for that fight. I'm not, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. So uh, here's another one, and I get this question all the time, but people are going to be mad if I don't ask it. If you go back in time, obviously knowing what you know now, what are the biggest changes you make for yourself as a, as a fighter, somebody trained? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, though, right? So – and it's it's unfair, right? Because I couldn't have possibly known, and a, and a lot of what has come about in sports science, um, you know, didn't even, you know, we were doing. Like, I always tell people like Adam's kind of ahead of it, you know. Adam Adam was reading, you know, he had us doing like Crawley like in two thousand one or something, you know, like when it was the thing, and uh, you know, so. Had us kind of on the right schedule. I think I just would have concentrated more on learning the sport. I've been so anti martial artist, you know. My internet connection is unstable, but I was very anti martial artist. I thought of a artist as a fat guy in Pumas. And uh, I remember when I got in my house, I put on the application prize fighter, you know, to like get a house. I w don't do that though, they make you put more money down. To get that if you have like a weird profession like that so i would uh you know kind of learn and and be a martial lot more than ah, i'm a fighter yeah and that's a good answer what about you adam what would you have have your athletes doing different you know i like forrest said we didn't know that we didn't know what we were doing so we were really experimenting on how to integrate everything Mm -hmm. and we were doing that as we went. I mean, I don't – we didn't have any real high-level wrestlers in our camp at, at the early days. Uh, we were really good on the cage. We were really good in the clinch, the areas that, that we could develop without having, you know, a room full of high-level wrestlers. But I, I think that that's a necessity now. If you have a camp, you need a couple of real high-level wrestlers just to know how to deal with that. Um, I think we I think we did a lot of good stuff back then. I'm not sure, like Forrest said, it's hard to answer. Um, I think we were on the right track back then. Um, you know, we were boxing we were boxing heavy because that was our background. Uh, now it takes a little more than than just boxing. Uh, so maybe we would have we would have investigated that a little more. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I, I think we were on the right track. You know, now that you mentioned that we were boxing at first, and then we kind of found Scott and John, and then we we just switched to Muay Thai. You know, we we Matt, I think what he's did saying is did we switch kind of, to Muay Thai, well, or did we just add kicks to our boxing? I switched to Muay Thai. I would say I changed my stance a bit. Okay. I, I changed a bit. Um, 
I, uh, but, but we, we basically, we trained with the best we had, right? So when we had access to good boxing, that's what we did. And then we had access to good Muay Thai, so we did Muay Thai. You know, we, we drove to Atlanta. You had really good jiu-jitsu in Atlanta. You drove to uh, a different state, maybe for a league, you know? There wasn't a ton of wrestling, but, you know, we, we, we made the best of the kind of the people we had around in their sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my answer to that is always the same. I think that here with my early group of fighters, we were using way too much head contact. So that would be the thing I'd go back and change. But again, there, there was no such thing as an MMA coach. The only people I had to model myself off of were boxing coaches. Basically. See, now I knew, I knew early though two things. I knew that we had to control our head contact as much as possible. It doesn't mean we always did it. Right. But I knew we had to do that. I knew that, and this is your influence on us, I knew that we had to create drills properly to bring out this, the development that we needed, that it couldn't just be sparring everything all the time. Right. And hand in hand with that went the idea that I knew we had to avoid catastrophic injuries. And those three things really meshed with each other. I wouldn't change those things at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe my answer is more uh, the technical aspects of MMA are different now than they were back then. Yeah. Right. Brian Bowles won a world title. He never threw a kick. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a guy now who could win a world title without throwing a kick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and don't you but think I, that, like the, the clinch that's going on up against the, the cage, it's not that deli- the, the delivery system is different, but it's almost a different art. It's almost a different wrapping art, don't you think? I think, and Forrest, Forrest will correct me, what I've seen is I've seen two things evolving recently. One is the real evolution on the cage is as, at the after the takedown has occurred. Yeah. You that, up. Yeah. The control that you're seeing people use on in that position is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm also seeing that, and, and I, that it's very difficult to take someone down against the cage. Mm-hmm. And I think you're going to see an evolution of guys coming back off the cage, more single legs and things like that. Forrest? So I'm sometimes confused, both parties, if I'm shooting on you and you're defending the takedown, I see both parties want to go to the cage. Um, yeah. I've got a crazy stat here in UFC, which is odd to me, right? Like offensively, I don't know. I feel like offensively you can rest on the cage a little bit, but that takedown sometimes becomes a little harder now. It used to be easier for me like because people didn't seem to know how to defend takedowns on the fence. And when we did work with wrestlers, like when I moved out here, I found out that I could work very high-level wrestlers with just a few things that, that I'd learned from you guys on if I could get them, you know, Greco clinching, tie clinching on the fence. They were a little bit uncomfortable, whereas I was more comfortable. So I was like, I was always fence wrestling. So then when, when people talk about the importance of it, I'm like, well, you know, coming from you guys with that clinch heavy concept, that's where I wanted to be. I am a horrible freestyle wrestler. I have horrible reaction time and speed on, on a sprawl, but against the fence, well, now it's a little, it's a little more muscle. It, it, you're a little slower. I can feel where you're going because I've been doing this. And, you know, you really have to explode in to pull me off as opposed to just explode through, which is actually easier just to explode through and take a guy down. So I'm sometimes confused by why both parties seem to go to the clinch. Now, you mean both parties go to the cage? Go to the fence, yeah. 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 Like, uh, yeah, I forget. There's there's a crazy stat, but... uh, yeah, I probably should have looked it up, but yeah, like very. You, you sent it. To, you sent it to me once. You sent me the stat, and it was like seventy percent of all takedowns are completed on the cage, and only thirty percent are right. in the middle. I yeah. made up seventy thirty, but yeah, it was something like that. Something. Like that. It was when you thought. Um. Yeah. 
now that people like Khabib and others have weaponized the, the, the grounded portion against the cage, I think you're going to see people have to possibly react a little differently. When you got taken down on the cage years ago, wall walking and getting up was not as difficult as it is becoming again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and now, the Dagestani leg. Yeah, yeah. I was just about to say, I mean, watching Islam Makachev this weekend with that in standing up inside trip against the cage, I'm like, here we go. You know, go in the gym Monday and we better learn how to do that. Yeah, that brings up the, the next question everybody asks all the time. But where do you guys see the sport? What do you see that as the next big evolutions within the within the sport? If there is any. From what I've seen, it, it goes in phases, right? So we, you know, you have the jujitsu phase, wrestling phase. So, so right now, I think, you know, you are... <laughs> Or we're in the calf kick phase. I don't know. I, just knew, somebody, I knew it. Calf kicks. Figure out how to freaking defend that already, you know? <laughs> it's, it's ruining the sport. It's such a low, you know, you know, so, you know, trends and, and phases. Right now, so over the last few years, the uh, the sport hasn't changed that much. So I think right now we're kind of in a bit of a plateau. And then, you know, as the athleticism comes, They'll, they'll be able to jump. Um, fighters are becoming more active. I can tell you that. There's a higher activity level. Um, what do you mean more uh, active? You having more fights on a shorter time frame? No, no, no. More, I'm sorry. More, more uh, effective striking. Yeah. So okay. more strikes, more landed strikes. Yet, at the same time, the uh, knockout rate has gone down. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's coming much more technical. People, people are learning better defenses. I think that's a big key right now. People are learning how to play defense. Sometimes, I mean, there's some fights that are boring. Yeah. It's like, oh, God, this footwork's good. I wish he would stop with that good footwork and fight, though. Something that, something that Forrest has really helped me understand the last couple of years as a coach is we could talk about evolution in, in two different ways. I think that there'll always be a ebbs and flows or this people finding old things again whatever's old is new and and now it's and, and it goes in waves and all sports it sort of does that yeah. but what Forrest has really helped me understand is that there are big differences in the way fighters should approach the strategy depending on on their gender and their weight class and and I got to tell you yep. that is am I not supposed to say this? No, no, no. That's what I was thinking. I should have led with, but keep going. Too late. Um, and and I I'll admit this. I trained all my guys. Not I trained them all in the same fundamentals, which I don't think has changed at all. But I never thought of the next piece as what is the strategy that's specific to this weight class. What is the strategy specific to this weight class and this gender? And I think that that is going to be a, a decent place to evolve tactically and strategically in the future. Forrest is going to tell us, he's going to give us some good examples, I bet. Maybe, maybe. We'll see. No, it's, right. So you're not preparing for the same sport is basically what he's saying. You know, women's 125 pound or even the men. So another thing you didn't see in our time, and Adam told me to stop it. I was a good jumper. So I used to jump knee and jump spin kick people yeah. and do like ridiculous techniques where I would leave my feet on the ground. And those were kind of verboten back then, right? Mm -hmm. but, but now it's, uh, you know, now it's just par for the course, especially if you're at those lower weight classes. So I think, you know, I think you kind of got to break down what's happening per weight class more. That's really it. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't have it handy in front of me. The numbers. Okay. He's uh, got a lot of. He's got a lot of numbers, though. I've spent maybe 110, 20 days in China in the past three years. I mean, ain't no crime. Pe people are organized over there, you know. So is it's not the, the worst thing I've seen. <laughs> is the UFC opening up in China now? Is that what's happening? Oh yeah. There, there's a. Yeah, there's a academy over there, a PI Shanghai. Um, yeah, there's uh, we've gotten like 
five, five or six fighters to the UFC from the academy. And then the first, I guess, less than two years, uh, we've got a training cohort of about 27, I think. Okay. So we, we kind of created a combine and all this, you know, stuff. And now we're just evaluating and identifying talent and, and just trying to get, you know, tr trying to speed up the evolution of Chinese MMA, right? So we kind of drop in a system with MMA, like our PI system. And then you kind of, you try to get that to spread to other gyms and just, you know, I, I, I'll bore you, but it's, you know, you think about like less than 10% of <clears throat> Chinese population has ever been exposed to MMA. I have a theory that about 30% of all people will kind of like or gravitate towards MMA. But I think that's your ceiling because at the end of the day, it's still fighting. Now that ceiling will increase as it becomes more of a sport and as kids grow up with it as an accepted sport, it would be more like basketball and football. I'll still sometimes get stuck and waste an hour of my life watching a football game just because I appreciate it when I was a teenager, right? So anyway, where I'm going with that percentage of, you know, people that would potentially be fans is in China, that's low. What will help? Hey, people that speak their language, more Chinese fighters. So that, that will, you know, so I think you, you've got a lot of, uh, you know, you'd call it like opportunity for trainability, right? For adaptation. So you've got a lot of opportunity for growth in those markets. You throw a PI there, you, you expedite the talent potential, um, and that's kind of our, our model. Very. How, how long? How long until we have a male Chinese champion? What would you say? Hey, when we opened this up, it was how long till we have a Chinese champion? I and I was right, thinking, but we've already done. That. I was thinking. I was thinking. I was there with Song Yudong, and I was thinking maybe you know he, he lost this weekend. Still a good fight, but <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know. I don't know, but. You know, it's getting closer every day. And how long until the how long until the UFC has to have these international champion like uh, country type champions? Because I'll tell you this about Americans: they don't love a sport where Americans can't be champions. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that. You know, if there's a if there's an American champion, Americans will gravitate and watch that fighter and. and we don't even have to get any deeper than that. But if I use, I use none Jamaica of the champions, example, yeah. if, if none of the champions speak English in their interviews afterwards, I think that that limits your marketability. What, what it, just take everything you said and move that towards China, though. So that's what sure. we're, trying, we're trying to create China, you know, so the interview is in you know, Mandarin after the fight. And that, that goes the same for everywhere, right? So what you're getting into is like in 10 years, are there, you know, the America's championship where Americans and Brazilians and Canadians fight each other versus the Europe championship versus the, you know, the, the South Asia, the APAC region, whatever. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how uh, Africa is set up currently. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're about to have two champions who make a claim to Nigeria. Yeah. We're going to have multiple champions who make claims to Dagestan or countries that, you know, didn't exist 10 years ago. And it's, I love it. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I'm a fan. I'll watch anyone fight, but I, I wonder for marketability's sake. Yeah. The GSP changed the landscape in Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, with, without that Canadian star, though, will that kind of, will that viewership diminish? I don't know. So the last question I've got for you is somebody asked about Forrest. When dealing with UFC personalities, who surprised you? Uh, um, well, I've known Masvidal for a while. I got to know him a couple years ago. I, I don't know why. I was just in Florida working out with him. So, you know, he's, he's always – he. He hasn't changed as much as it seems like he has, you know, he's always kind of been that backyard fighting guy. And now he's the backyard fighting guy with money and popularity. Um, so I would say that. And then Dustin Poirier is exactly as nice and humble and, and good as he seems. Uh, you know, he won like the UFC kind of person of the year award, the, you know, the charity aspect award. Um, I got a good story for you though. Yeah. I forget who it was, maybe 
I forget. Somebody was in here, Australian fighter, and Izzy was actually one of their training partners. And I saw Izzy hit mitts in the boxing ring up here. And I said, uh, I had no idea who he was. I, I went up to him and said, hey, man, you ever uh, think about doing mixed martial arts? He's like, no, I do. <laughs> Where, where you fight? Where, where you fight? And, and that, but the only fight I could find of his was uh, him and when he beat Melvin Giard up in MMA. And I was like, well, Melvin's a 55er fighting you at 85. And he's obviously just shooting for his life. And he obviously had no idea what he was getting into with you. Um, you know, and anyway, like, like a month later, he's like the biggest thing in the world. <laughs> so I just, hey, felt, so well, I got a question and you brought up Izzy without giving anyone chalkboard information. Yeah. If Usman went up to 85 and fought Izzy, what do you think? I, I don't know. No, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still think Israel can learn better takedown defense and, and, I just think the potential for Izzy to stop you or catch you or something is still very high. Wrestling or no wrestling. Okay. We'll see if that happens. We'll talk about that if it happens. Yeah. Well, Forrest, thanks again for taking the time to, uh, to come on here, man. It was good to talk to you. Uh, yeah, it was actually great to see you again, Matt. You, you look good for a man that's lived your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> considering everything you look great yeah i appreciate that thank you thanks too adam i really appreciate it you got it we'll talk to you guys soon thank you